protection for use, particularly in valve standards. Clean in place, CIP. Uh, this, this, stand, this definition has recently been modified from many of the older standards. Previously, uh, 3A had two very similar standards. One was CIP, the other was mechanically clean. And as time went on and uh, the Europeans and, and their uh, equipment people and processing people and, and actually the people in the processors and users here in the States, CIP became the generic term for cleaning in place. The industry and the, the, the common interpretation of CIP did not make a distinction, as 3A did, that CIP was a very special class of equipment only where the in-place cleaning had been validated by studies, it had been documented and approved by the regulatory agency, generally milk safety branch. Whereas mechanically cleaned was everything else. You could circulate it, you could do anything you want with it as long as when you were done, everything was inspectable and could be taken apart and you could evaluate the cleaning very easily. In order for 3A to modernize and come to grips with the common and usual use of the terms, we have recently modified our definition for CIP to be all-inclusive, both that type of equipment like silo tanks, pipelines, which you cannot see every surface because of the bends and stuff, but they are there have been studies conducted and proven that the systems, if properly engineered and properly operated, will, will clean and will clean consistently. Plus all of the other types of equipment where they got a spray ball in it and they run it and they clean it. And so now CIP covers everything. Specific things, as it says here, there's a drafter's note that you have product contact surface to be CIP cleaned are inspectable, which is the old mechanically cleanable, or product contact surfaces that are inspectable except as specified in E1522, which is a internal cross-reference to a section in the fabrication section. And this is, uh, and this is that cross-reference which basically says when cleanability by CIP, you list that, has been documented and accepted by the regulatory agency, then the design shall be representative. Surfaces are readily accessible for cleaning. So this is the tie-in back to the older, more specific CIP definition. So the intents of the two older definitions are still included, but now we're using the terms that are more commonly understood in the dairy industry. Uh, there are definitions for uh, other methods of, of cleaning, uh, out of place cleaning, COP tanks, things of those nature, manual cleaning, and dry cleaning. Uh, cleaning is, is one of the more important aspects of a 3A sanitary standard and of a TPV inspection. And we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get into the fabrication section because the method of cleaning should be declared up front by the fabricator of the equipment because it can impact on multiple different sections within a standard. So if, if somebody declares within the standard that this is a CIP peeable piece of equipment, then you have to look at the criteria differently than if you looked at something that is declared to be mechanically clean, be broken down and opened up and cleaned on a daily basis. There are much more stringent requirements, obviously, for something that's going to be cleaned in place. Other uh, definitions that have caused the confusion at times, uh, readily accessible, identifies a location or uh, a place where a piece of equipment can be safely inspected 
from personnel. This is something that's in there for the benefit of plant cleaning people and operators as well as inspection personnel that if there's a piece of equipment on there that needs inspection, you can get at it. It's uh, safely reached by personnel from the floor, other permanent works areas such as a catwalk or a walkway, or stable platform, permanent or movable. The permanent and movable is in there to allow for the use of a cherry picker or something, even a step ladder, if you can safely get up to it uh, using something like that, then it is considered as readily accessible. Now, readily accessible is dependent upon the standard that you're looking at. And from an inspection standpoint, when you're in a plant doing an inspection uh, and trying to evaluate a piece of equipment according to a 3A standard, readily accessible can be confusing. Of where does it apply and where does it not apply? A general rule of thumb is if the piece of equipment is small enough that you can hold it in your hand, like a temperature sensor or a pressure sensor or a valve, or something like this, according to the standard for valves or temperature sensors, it's readily accessible. Obviously, you got it in your hand. How much easier can it be? So if you find this valve or this sensor on the top of a silo tank, or maybe a better example is a um, rupture disk for a silo. According to the rupture disc standard, again, you can hold a rupture disc in your hand. You can look at it, and according to the standard, it says readily accessible. Well, it's readily accessible. But if you can't get to the top of the silo, it's not the rupture disc fault. It's the silo installation is at fault, and it hasn't allowed you access to the top. So really, the accessibility issue becomes germane under the silo standard, not the rupture disk standard. So a good rule of thumb is if you can have it on a table like a pump, or you can squat down to look at it, hold it in your hand, accessibility isn't the issue. Uh, readily removable is something that's designed and to be installed and quickly separated from the equipment with or without the use of simple hand tools. And so we've defined simple hand tools to be screwdriver, wrench, the ever popular mallet, or any other readily available dedicated tool that normally operating and sanitizing people would have available to them. And it might be something as, as special as a specialized wrench. If you have to have a special spanner type wrench to get DIN type fittings off or something. And those uh, are all considered as simple hand tools. We also define in, in a number of standards, particularly standards of relatively large equipment, heavy equipment, where it only needs to be removable, in which you now have to get some more complex tool or you need to get uh, the plant maintenance people involved. A uh, common example is a self-cleaning separator. You're not going to take the bowl apart and pull it apart with simple hand tools. You need all kinds of things to get into a self-cleaning separator to make sure that the discs are clean and the CIP and, and, and things are being properly conducted. Obviously, the, the two most common uh, definitions that will be in all standards are, are your product contact surfaces and your non-product contact surfaces. The real defining things is that direct contact with the product or from any surface from which splash product, liquids or material may drain, drop, diffuse, or be drawn into the product. So this is the, the old drip, drop, or drain concept of what constitutes a product contact surface. And in that, so it's not just things that the top that the product touches, but it's also the underside of covers that might be splashed on or condensate can drip down when it's in a closed vessel. 
or it also might be those surfaces that come in contact with the product contact surface of packaging materials. So if you're on a gable top filler, those little flapper arms that open the container up, they're touching the inside of the container. They're product contact. If you're looking at a form fill and seal machine and you watch the webbing or the, the trail of the packaging machine material as it goes through a form fill and seal machine, some of the rollers will touch the outside of the packaging material, but other rollers and other components, some of the forming shoes, some of the other things, will be touching the product contact surface of the packaging materials. So product contact surfaces can be in areas of a machine, particularly on packaging machines, where you might not immediately expect it to be a product contact surface. So there's, there's lots, lots to consider on, on defining and correctly identifying what is a product contact surface. The non-product contact surface basically is all other exposed surfaces. And this is an important word that has over the years been expressly and purposely put into the definition so that it excludes surfaces that aren't exposed to splash and spill and spray off the floor. So you don't, you don't need to consider the inside of a control cabinet as a non-product contact surface. It's really outside of the scope of the document. Now that's not to say that if you have a, uh, an Anderson cup filler or something for cottage cheese or yogurt filling that you've got cabinets that open underneath. That's not to say that those aren't those are unimportant areas and shouldn't be maintained in a reasonably clean condition, relatively free of excess oil and grease, but they're not technically covered by the 3A standards. That's why uh, it doesn't just say all surfaces that are subject to splash. We only are concerned about the exposed surfaces. <laughs>